Andre and Stewart from Evolutions app, and today we have Tony Chung, who is the owner of Tan Chun. Tom, damn it, I screwed it up. Tan, Tony Tan Chung. Chung. Tony. Tony Chung. Tan Chu. Yes. Tan Chu Martial Arts Academy. That's 100% on me. I apologize. This young man is a owner of multiple martial arts studios in Atlanta, Georgia. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I have four here in, in Atlanta. Oh. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today kicks off uh, an entire month of us uh, interviewing business owners, successful athletes that have transitioned into the business world. And uh, maybe Stuart, you can give us a little bit of uh, more light in terms of how you guys reconnected and how you guys know each other. Yeah, I right, thank you. Tony, again, thank you for reaching out to me a few weeks ago and we connected. And I was just so impressed, one, by your humility and wanting to reach out and ask questions and, and being humble. That's a true martial arts spirit. And then, as you know, I started my first martial arts school and when I was 19 years old, and my thought process was, I'm just going to kick and teach kids how to kick. And I never really took the business approach. You know, Now looking back 20 years later, what I could have done and what I could have learned. And your approach to business, how you franchise a model, but also your stewardship from a leadership and ownership standpoint. You're, correct me if I'm wrong, but your, your main staff are all on salary. They have health care benefits, so on and so forth, where I knew back in the day 20 years ago, my peers were just trying to you know, get kids in, get their belts, and pay rent. And so I was just so impressed by you completely overall. So thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for having me. I, well, maybe, you know, go ahead, go ahead, go Andre. Ahead. Uh, my, my quick question, maybe, uh, Tony, can you give us a little bit more of your background prior to you opening up the school uh, and then prior to you having this conversation with Stuart? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, I'm Tony Chung. I was born in Kokomo, Indiana, of, uh, of all places. Uh, very small town. Um, my my dad, my both of my uncles are grandmasters. Uh, my father's a grandmaster. Um, it's been in martial arts has been in my family for five generations since 1874. Uh, but my my father and my uncles were the first generation to come to the United States. I was the first person in our entire Chung family to be born out of South Korea. Very homogenous family, and then somehow we ended up in Indiana. And you're like martial arts is booming in the early, early 70s and my father you know like manufacturing was big so like you know he did a demonstration in indianapolis and then these grandmasters were breaking like boards and stuff and people were going crazy and then my dad like he's an iron hand grandmaster so like he he smashes like coke bottles with his hands he can like spear house bricks and he he demonstrated everybody was like oh crazy like where's your school and he's like i'm trying to open a school and then all the grandmasters got together and they're like we're going to put you in the biggest city on the planet and they put him in kokomo indiana <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know that they was the definition of the biggest city they, of the planet. i think they got together like five thousand dollars it was like 12 grandmasters because they're all stressed out about because my dad le legitimate badass he's uh he's a korean marine rock soldier um tough guy he lived in china for seven years because he we're not we're originally a judo family and then uh my uncles are big they both competed at the collegiate world levels for judo uh one was on the olympic team uh, in 64 uh for tokyo uh, olympics and my father was small like he's i'm six one but my dad is like five seven and my uncles are six two plus they're big one's in dayton ohio the other one's in la and uh, they used to throw my dad around, and my dad hated judo, so he wanted to learn how to, like, strike, so he spent a lot of time traveling and training, doing all kinds of stuff, so he knew, you know, a lot of different types of martial arts, multiple weapons, uh, so when he demonstrated, people were like, he was fancy, you know, um, and he used to smash, you know, stuff with his hands, and so we ended up in Kokomo, Indiana, and um, my family almost died from a blizzard because we got stuck in a snowdrift and it was uh, it was time to get this time to get out of the, the oh, it was time to get out of Kokomo. Uh, yeah my dad my dad had built up it was called a1 karate because it was all about the phone book at the time right so right one steak sauce karate and then my dad had 14 programs uh, mul multiples in the ymcas and then he had like maybe four or five brick and mortar really didn't make that much money and then he bought some grandmasters territory in Melbourne, Florida, and he he built this like massive school um, back in uh, in the early nineties, and that was our claim to fame. He built a, a pretty big martial arts school. 
Tony, and, for those non-martial artists out there, can you give like a five second disclaimer of what a grandmaster mean, what it means to something? Yeah, you know, that's a very good question. So, you know, what is a black belt? What is a, you know, black belt, in my opinion, is an expert. A master is somebody that, that can develop other experts and, and, and mastery level, uh, you know, abilities. Like, and then a grandmaster is like, you, you're trained in masters. That's a very good mm -hmm. question. You know, I, I just got my grandmastership about three years ago and, Dude, I was so young. I didn't expect it. Like, dude, all like we're part of the World Martial Arts Council, and then I am a Kukiwan school, and and a lot of people. I got a lot of flack. People were like, "I was like, dude, I didn't ask for this." <laughs> well, that, that actually, that actually, that principle that martial arts that's a good segue, Andre. That that martial arts principle carries over in the world of business and just any sort of leadership, right? So people think a lot of times you think just because you have your title and your business cards as managers, you're a yeah. leader of others, which is not true. So true mastership is being able to not only do it yourself but teach others but the next level is can you teach the teachers and even beyond that my view of, of grandmastership expert level like you know you know knowledge is now can you move the industry forward can you move martial arts forward it's not less can you give back can you develop the next iteration so there's taekwondo there's judo there's you know fast food there's health and wellness there's sporting apparel or so on and so forth but now true mastership grandmastership is take all those boxes now, can you move the industry forward? Can you create a new industry? Can you create a new mark in life, a legacy behind? So that's for how you grandmastership in the world of business. Man, since you said that, so I had a picture I wanted to show you guys. I don't know if it's appropriate, but let's see. I hope it's appropriate. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Uh, okay. My black okay. Contact. Yeah, so I finally broke my brick. You know, my dad, you know, he had like a very rigorous black belt test like everybody did back in the day. And, uh, the Guinness Book of World Records came out. I was five years, five months old when I first tested for my black belt. Dude, I failed for uh, it's like 18 straight months, year and a half. No record. I have some small article from the Kokomo Tribune. And I remember crying after I broke my brick. I passed all, you know, I memorized all my patterns. The under six is a big deal. You know, all the, at that time they were pipeways. And did all my, you know, sparring, you know, I was the only kid. My mom made my uniform. There's like no kids really training back then. And my dad did definitely didn't want to teach kids, but you know, he wanted to teach me. And my, my brother and sister are seven to nine years older than me. So, you know, I was just training with them. So when I finally got my black belt, dude, it was like no big deal. I thought I was going to be famous. And then I was crying and my dad was like, well, what the hell's wrong with you? And I was like, I'm not going to be famous. And then my dad said, one day you'll, you'll understand why I made you wait. And then mm -hmm. when I was uncomfortable about my grandmastership and they sat down, we're having dinner afterwards, after the ceremony, I was just like, you know, I, I really, you know, I'm going to get a lot of flack for this. I'm not even 40 yet. And, you know, I'm already getting blown up. People are like, I'm not even an eighth on Guanjang Nim. Like, what makes you think you're a Guanjang Nim? And, and then my uncles and my father said, listen, a lot of the masters that came from Korea and Japan and, you know, even China back in the day, dude, they were barely black belts. And then they just got called master. And, you know, this whole invention of like waiting a certain amount of time and testing, which I've done all of the testing and, you know, kooky one stuff and master instructor <laughs> certification. It's, it's, it's a lot of bureaucracy and red tape. And, and sometimes that's good because it kind of creates standards, but, you know, you're 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 where you are because you've earned it and you know ever since your your first black belt test you know when you failed you know you had the option to quit and and you know you're a grandmaster because our industry needs people to push the needle forward as, as you said and I, I never knew what that meant i didn't know if it was like build a building like most people want to build a building but like my father built like this massive building and you know and I thought he was going to give me the key one day and I was going to take the school over and he essentially said, go make your own. And then mm. that was about, I don't know, 14 years ago. I was in South Florida for a while, had a partner. We had 10 schools then didn't like the direction of the curriculum because, you know, I was making money finally, but I wasn't happy, especially as a teacher. And, you know, I, I fought, I was a coach and I just didn't feel good about what I was doing. I felt good to make money. It's nice to make money. Then right. finally start, you know, I lived in Boca when you start making money and there's, it's weird. Like you, you're not filled. So I came to Atlanta. I started all over. It was really tough. Um, went through some struggles. And then as soon as I made some money, 
instead of paying myself, I hired my first employee. And then one foot in front of the other, uh, I got to about 800 students right before my grand mastership. And uh, I had four masters under me uh, that, you know, that came from all different levels. Leona Machida's system came over, like Master Ethan Woodson came over and works with me. You know, Stephen Chun, you know. As a, hey, Tony, as a small business owner, um, making that, so there's two things I want to ask you. So sure. let's be succinct here in your response. One, you had a system going on, you had a partnership, you had 10 schools, you were making money, as you said, but there was an internal calling to do something different. I find that people in life are always challenged with, making that switch, chasing their dream. They know they're not doing their dream or it's not something's wrong. Something's wrong, but they don't know exactly what it is. But there's comfort in saying, I know what today you know, brings versus the unknown of tomorrow. So I want to know, what was a catalyst for you going from 10 schools to starting over? And then secondarily, as a small business owner, tell me about the pressure it felt when making that first hire and paying yeah. him or her first than yourself. So, man, lots of good questions. So. I think if I define it to a moment just off of my memory right now, it's like we had this massive black belt test and nobody failed, which is fine if nobody failed, but I felt that people should have failed, right? And I I think that when people look at a coach or a mentor or uh, a teacher, that if they admire them and they want to walk in their footsteps, that they have to literally walk in their footsteps. I was built on failure, right? Uh, well, that was the, you know, my first experience with success is failure. And I wanted to offer that to the students. And, and, and I don't want to just fail people to put a thumb down. I, you know, I want them to earn it. And, you know, that's a tagline and people say it, you know, but like I, I genuinely wanted to do it. And here I was with everything, you know, and, and, you know, I wasn't happy. So came to Georgia built it up, and, and I always teach from the mat, I sell from the mat, I run my business from the mat, my primary function now is, is still teaching. Um, I'm a great salesman, I sucked at, I couldn't, I couldn't sell a phone call before, but I've learned to become a better salesman. But um, yeah, when I made my first hire, it wasn't good, man, he's no longer with me, he stole from me. <laughs> but I was just like, hey man, uh, this is how much the school's bringing in. I can afford to pay you this. I've, I'm always transparent. I always like to tell people, you know, how much money, like all my employees, they know exactly how much I make. They know how much comes into the company, out of our company, our operating account balance. We're very transparent because I'll never make as much as they think I make. Right. Uh, how did you, how did you, how did you find out that he was uh, stealing from the company? Oh man. So I, I had multiple locations at that time when I found out and, uh, you know, I just started going back and forth between two locations, you know, trying to like pigeon management, which I've found is not good. Um, and then one school just had tons of people like quitting, 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 quitting. And I was like, okay, well, that's strange. And then uh, that's a lot of delinquencies. That's a lot of like, you know, terminations. And, and I was like, okay. And I started digging into it. And then I started making calls myself and they're like, oh no, we, we had, we paid, we, we paid to cancel. And I was like, Oh, okay. Thank you. And then, uh, turns out he just offered them like, you know, you write the check to Johnny cash and I'll cancel your agreement. And, gotcha. um, you know, it was a lesson learned and it's partially my fault for not knowing what's going on in my business. You know? and, when you, when you make your first hires, right. So I think a lot of times, you know, still 75% of America works for fortune 500. So they're not necessarily ownership. They don't have the ownership mentality. So what's interesting is, you know, when you're a small business or startup or wherever you want to look at it, the owners, we all go for this for very reasons, you know, various reasons. I want independence. I want to make all the money or I want to do things my way. But ownership is all in constant, all inclusive. So you own everything. But I think a lot of times small business owners, certainly startup founders think I'm going to make all the money. But when you make your first, second, third hire, oftentimes, and Andre can attest this, that as owners, we're the last paid and oftentimes the least paid employees. So you know, you have to make sure that you're building your staff up, supporting them, all, everything goes, all the resources go to marketing, you know, brick and mortar support and your, your team. And I'm curious, and also when you first start out, you're, you're building a culture, right? So you make your first, second hire. When it's just you, you can control the culture. And when it's two people, the culture changes, as well as your school's growing, you have yes. 50 students, the culture changes to 500 to 5,000. So I'm curious now where you are today, how many employees do you have and kind of what's that makeup? Because there's yes. a martial arts aspect of it too. There's the 
respect that you know, levels of black folk, but there's also probably, I, I would assume maybe your, your most important employee might not be the highest ranked in martial arts. So how do you manage that dynamic? Absolutely. Very good question. So uh, my, and, and before I finish the last, I just want to finish the last thing. My bad was, I think I was paying the guy $1,800 a month and he was an independent contractor. So it was disgustingly low pay for the hours. Mm -hmm. And then there's a cut of staff member that you get for that quality and there's an expectation. So uh, I think that that first employee failed because I failed somewhere, you know, uh, and, and I always regret like, you know, messing up, you know, just like you lose tournaments back in the day. It's not just because I wasn't good enough to, you know, it's, that's the main thing. But, um, you know, when it comes to our employees now, we have 10 full-time, I'm sorry, 11 full-time employees. We have 11 full-time employees and I don't even know, maybe close to 30 part-time employees. And out of our part-timers, I think, especially like right now, maybe there's like 10 or 12 that are more active. Um, I have a lot of, you know, we start hiring at 14 years old. Um, and then, you know, we have people in high school, college, you know, after college. Um, and then now we're getting some employees back because we're teaching virtually. So we have people that have moved away that are able to get some hours and they just like being around. And our part-timers don't do it for the money. Um, our full-timers, uh, my average full-timer makes 60,000 a year, which is pretty standard for, for Georgia. Um, and I do have some high income earners that make over a hundred thousand and entry level are, you know, closer to 45 or so. And then we offer benefits and it's, you know, it, it's more as you get more tenure. Um, I'm, I'm curious from a business aspect, Tony, how does, how does somebody make a differential in terms of pay? Is it because they're enrolling more students because they're teaching a larger class size? How, I mean, I, I, uh, I just yes, know from very, martial arts that I don't know. Yeah, that. Very, very good question. Currency so, uh, of uh, martial arts. <laughs> So I have a bonus system and my bonus system has all of these different like, you know, types of bonuses, but the main one is your, your pool. So my billing checks makes up a vast majority, like our tuition, uh, that month, the monthly tuition that comes in, it makes up a mass, a vast majority of our gross. So you cannot, if you have good sales, you can, you know, like my, my, I would say like my higher level martial arts schools, they bring in about half a million dollars a year, uh, pretty consistently. Uh, we just, we don't do summer camps. We don't do any camps that no after school pickup, just martial arts and all my full timers work 30 hours or, or like myself. Wow. Um, and I'll get back to that work less hard thing. Cause I never want to retire. I just want to enjoy life as I go about it much like, uh, Mr. Stewart here. Um, so it's very, very important to me that they do what's right in the long term. Right. Because, you know, I think, you know, sometimes you're stepping over dollars to pick up pennies to get through the month. But, you know, I learned my lesson from the first employee that I was underfunded. Right. So part of my big thing was I need to have a certain amount of operating capital in the like in the event of an emergency. And here we are, you know, in an emergency and, and it's it's still, you know, rice and beans. And, you know, we have to pivot to make it. But you know, I am not worried about getting through this month. I'm, I'm worried about getting through this year. You know, I, I, I have enough capital to get me through the end of the year and it, it, it puts our staff at ease. And when you're able to, to create bonus systems that make them think for the longevity. So you can't build a billing check to north of $20,000 in my, in my particular model without teaching great classes, right? Producing good black belts, right? So it is a, it is a, it's a harder thing to, to lift it, Like you have to lift the tide in order to unlock the maximum bonus. And, um, you know, I don't, I push sales and everything, but everything is based on the billing check. So whether you enroll one person in a month or you enroll 10 people in a month, uh, it, 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 it fluctuates based off of what your billing check is and what you're contributing to the billing check. So I can have a new person come into my organization and they can be, uh, they can run a great school in a couple of years and make more than the person that's been with me for the whole 10 years. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a very fair system. Uh, that's that's uh, some amazing information. Uh, never knew the background in terms of how martial arts and economics uh, play together. That's uh, phenomenal. And, and, and I'm so I sorry, I, I run my entire business off of QuickBooks and Excel spreadsheets and everything 
everything, everybody has full access except for individual payroll numbers. They're welcome to share right. with each other, but they're not able to access everybody's payroll without asking that individual. But Makes as far sense. as like our profit and loss accessibility, other than the individual pay, they can, they can see what payroll's like uh, at any time. Like right now, every one of my employees that are full-time from their home, they can access everything and they can go back all the way historical from, from Adam here in Georgia when I started. I'm a big awesome. fan of transparency with, with, with staff. It, it you know, builds up authenticity. Um, it helps build up that ownership mentality. But, you know, I don't know if this is on purpose, but you can also see probably some, a, not a competition, but a healthy comparison. Like, oh, that's what they're doing. I can get those yes. numbers up and so on and so forth. So it helps build the whole momentum of the system. That's great. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I think uh, yes. with that, let's, uh, let's take a quick break. Uh, and then when we come back, let's, uh, let's do some rapid fire questions about you, Tony. We want to learn a little bit more about okay. where you're at, what's going on, what's next, and go from there.